FRPL is having a fundraiser for the Evelyn Bailey Children's Stand-On in Dallas Fund, which will help provide staff and resources at Central Library to preserve and share the history of Rochester's LGBTQ plus community through archival collections and programming. Love is love. We have a $10,000 matching grant for gifts received by March 31st. Visit ffrpl.org for more information or to donate online. We present programs such as today's BSI review. FFRPL is a founding sponsor of the annual Art of the Book and Paper exhibit. The deadline for entries for the next show is May 15th. Artists can complete their online entry at rockcitylibrary.org. FFRPL is proud to help fund, present, and promote this project, which is now in its 13th year. FFRPL helps organize and fund murals at Central and throughout the branch libraries on an ongoing basis. The two most recent of these specialized spaces include Sean Dunwoody's new portrait of Frederick Douglass at the Frederick Douglass branch in late 2023, and the new interior murals at the Wheatley branch, which were just installed this month. FFRPL also purchased thousands of eclipse glasses for Central Library and RPL City branches in preparation for the total eclipse on April 8th. Patrons at Central can receive up to two pairs of free eclipse glasses per family with an MCLS library card or sign up for a library card at the circulation desk. You can contact the branches for their distribution details. Thanks to our donor support, FFRPL was able to purchase these supplemental materials. The library is an official Eclipse ambassador, working with the Rochester Museum and Science Center to present Eclipse programming and educate the community on the Eclipse and Eclipse safety. Visit rockcitylibrary.org for more information on library programs. Today, we'll hear a review of the rediscovery of America, Native peoples, and the unmaking of US history by Ned Blackhawk. Blackhawk's book begins with the question, how can a nation founded on the homelands of dispossessed indigenous peoples be the world's most exemplary democracy? He then analyzes five centuries of native and non-native histories to provide a more accurate narrative of the United States. Our presenter today is Brianna Theobald, Associate Professor of History at the University of Rochester and the author of Reproduction on the Reservation, Pregnancy, Childbirth, and Colonialism in the Long 20th Century. Please join me in welcoming Professor Theobald to our podium. Wow, um, this is a great group. Um, good afternoon. Thank you to the Rochester Public Library, the Friends of the Library for this really wonderful invitation. Um, my, I'll, I'll speak for maybe 25 minutes or so and then we'll have a little time for Q&A. Um, so in the meantime, during the talk, if you just wave your hand at me, um, I'll know that, uh, that that can be a good signal if you're not able to hear me, if I need to speak up um, or adjust the mic. Um, and then we'll do questions after. Um, so as someone who lives and works on the homelands of the Onondaga or Seneca Nation, it really is such an honor to have the opportunity to engage with members of the Rochester community regarding the indigenous history of these lands, whether that's um, we're talking these lands regionally um, or more broadly across the continent. Um, I imagine that many of you know that the um, Onondaga Nation is one of six, the six nations of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, um, and the Confederacy necessarily plays a pretty prominent role uh, in the book that I'll be discussing today, The Rediscovery of America. Let's see if we... Um, so for those of you who are unfamiliar with the author, Ned Blackhawk is an enrolled member of the, the Te Moak tribe of the Western Shoshone Indians of Nevada and a professor of history and American studies at Yale University. His first book entitled Violence Over the Land, Indians and Empires in the Early American West was published back in 2006. And by the time that I entered graduate school in 2010, it was really presented to students studying Native history as absolutely required reading. 
Um, that book won, I don't know, a half dozen or so awards. It was really pretty obscene, I thought. Um, this more recent book seems to be on a similar path. Um, it, it's already picked up a prestigious National Book Award, as you can see on the cover there. But before we dive into um, this text, the, the Rediscovery of America, I wanted to back up a little bit. Uh, historians are always obsessed with like all forms of context, right? So I wanted to set some context for the publication of this book. Um, so I wanted to back up to the fall of 2018, way back in the before times, before the pandemic, um, when Jill Lepore, a historian at Harvard and uh, a staff writer for The New Yorker, published this sweeping synthesis of United States history. It clocked in at more than 700 pages. Um, and in writing this book, which she titled These Truths, The History of the United States, um, and this was published, by the way, by W.W. W. Norton, so a prominent trade press, um, Lepore said that she intended, in her words, to rekindle a lost tradition. She later, later said that she, quote, set out to write a sweeping, synthetic, narrative history, even a lyrical history, again, these are her words, of the nation in all its anguish and its beauty. And Lepore explained her motivation um, for doing this as arising from a concern about the state of American democracy, which really resonates um, with that, that quote from the first page of the book. She saw a need for rigorous yet accessible shared narratives about the nation's history. And she lamented that academic historians, in her view, had largely ceded this ground to more ideologically driven writers who lacked um, historical training. Lepore aspired for a broad readership, um, envisioning these truths as both a, an American history textbook of sorts, and lots of folks are in fact using it in their classrooms, and also what she referred to as an old-fashioned civics book. The book is a tremendous achievement, and by all appearances, Lepore accomplished many of those stated goals. These Truths was uh, blurred by such high-profile figures as Bill Gates, um, and it was reviewed, the book was reviewed in all sorts of mainstream outlets from NPR to uh, the Oprah magazine, for example. Um, it also received significant attention from scholars. I, really vividly remember um, sitting in an absolutely packed standing room only banquet room um, in Philadelphia at the 2019 meeting of the Organization of American Historians, where Lepore was joined by a handful of other prominent scholars for a round table discussion about her book. So that's like a real um, honor. But it's also true that in this roundtable and in other venues, historians of Native America raised serious critiques. Namely, they lamented the marginalization of Native peoples in these truths. And they argued that this marginalization distorts our understanding of at least many of the, the very truths that Lepore thought to document and interpret. As the Lumbee scholar, Melinda Lowry, observed in that roundtable I mentioned, Quote, we may not see many American Indians when we read these truths, but the fate of the political principles it explores would be very different if Native peoples were not, in fact, significant actors in this history. Historians of Native America further noted that, that these, what they viewed as omissions, um, became especially glaring in the um, Lepore's treatment of the 20th and 21st centuries in the book. This is the book's really weightiest um, sections, in part because of um, some of Lepore's objectives. And in this part of the book, Native peoples have really all but vanished in Lepore's kind of purview in her narrative. And if there was one review published in the Los Angeles Review of Books that was entitled The Vanishing Indians of These Truths that was getting at that kind of idea. But the, this trend uh, toward kind of rekindling a lost uh, tradition, as, as Lepore um, framed it, toward these sweeping syntheses, toward big picture narratives, um, that has continued in recent years. Um, and a handful of texts published by historians of Native America 
have sought to challenge stories that are kind of structured around indigenous erasure um, by instead offering accounts that place Native peoples at the center of their story. This is admittedly a challenging or at least complicated task. Um, as I'm constantly emphasizing to my students, Native America is tremendously diverse. We're talking hundreds of tribal nations, um, more than 570 recognized by the US federal government alone. Um, there are more recognized by state governments. There are more that for various historical reasons are not recognized by a historical entity. And all of these hundreds of tribal nations, right, have distinct languages, cultures, geographies, and histories. But the flourishing of the field of Native American history in the last few decades, um, and particularly this, this kind of turn toward a new Indian history, which is more kind of indigenous centered, has led to a moment where these, these sorts of broad syntheses are, are seeming increasingly possible for historians. And that brings me to one other book that I want to mention before turning to our book of the hour. And that is um, the, a book called The Indigenous Continent um, by Pekka Hemelainen, um, a Finnish-born historian at Oxford University. So this was published in 2022, very recent, and it's another text that has received significant public attention in ways that I think is just really great for historians and for history. Um, both the New Yorker and the New York Times listed it among their best or most notable books of the year, for example. It too is a remarkable feat, um, a remarkable feat of scholarship. It chronicles um, what Hemelinen refers to as the dawn of the indigenous continent well before Columbus's arrival um, and extends through the 19th century. As in Hemelinen's first two books, um, entitled Comanche Empire and Lakota America, um, the focus here is on indigenous power. Scholars sometimes situate Hemelinen's work within what they refer to as, as the, the power turn in Native American scholarship. As the title suggests, this is a book, um, or this, this, this is really a story, I should say, of a continent where historical development occurred primarily through indigenous agency. That's the story that Hemelinen tells. European and later American actors play limited roles here as they are always constrained by the persistent power of those they hoped, but almost always failed in this view, view to subjugate. Indeed, very late into the 19th century, really up to the 1890 massacre at Wounded Knee in South Dakota, in which US forces massacred um, dozens or even hundreds, depending on the count, of, of Lakota people. Really up to that moment, Hemelinen Hemeline sounds the theme of American weakness. This is a very different view of history um, of history of the lands that currently constitute the United States than that presented in Lepore's These Truths. But here too, scholars have offered important critiques, as scholars love to do, right? For one thing, a story of indigenous power versus American weakness obscures the grave consequences of colonialism for indigenous communities, perhaps especially in the midst of the, the rapid and often brutal US westward expansion that char characterized the 19th century. And this makes it very hard, arguably almost impossible, to understand the history that followed Hemelinen's late 19th century endpoint. So many have suggested, when, when this book came out, many suggested that, that Hemelinen more or less kind of overcorrects, right? So he centers indigenous people in an, uh, the American continental story, but he sort of loses the United States in the process. And then, so this brings me, I promised we'd get here, right? This, this brings me to Professor Blackhawk's the, the Rediscovery of America, published just last year. And I don't mean to suggest that, that Blackhawk's book strikes some sort of perfect balance between these two poles that I've described. Um, but I do think that situating 
the rediscovery of America within the context of this, this, these high profile recent publications helps us to sort of understand what Black Hawk is trying to do here. His central claim is arguably a relatively simple one. He says that one really can't understand United States history without a central focus on indigenous history. This in itself is not an especially new argument. Um, in fact, nearly a decade ago, several scholars published an influential book um, of essays that's entitled um, pointedly, why you can't teach United States history without American Indians, okay? Getting at this, this same idea. But unsettling, or as Black Hawk's subtitle puts it, unmaking entrenched national narratives has proven a real challenge, as Lepore's These Truths um, and countless American history books suggest. So what Black Hawk attempts to do here is to offer a history of the United States that meaningfully and consistently accounts for Native peoples. Like Hemelainen, uh, excuse me, like Hemelainen, um, Black Hawk is concerned with indigenous agency, with thinking of indigenous people as historical actors. But he specifies in his introduction that it's really a particular form of agency that he is concerned with tracing throughout this text. Um, it, it's a form that he characterizes as, and I'm going to use his language here, quote, a dialectic of Indian newcomer relations that developed over centuries of interactions, bringing new communities together in inextricable and enduring ways. So it's that kind of dialectic relationship. Um, the concept that frames the rediscovery of America then is not uh, the Eurocentric framework of discovery, um, but it's also not that of conquest or, for that matter, power, which are two frameworks um, that have become important in the field of Native American and Indigenous Studies scholar, um, excuse me, in the field of Native American and Indigenous Studies. Rather, as his dialectic suggests, or his kind of framing of the dialectic suggests, for him, um, in this book, the, the key concept is encounter. So probably you won't be able to see this very well. These are very, very sloppy, quick um, snapshots of the table of contents, but I just wanted to give you a sense of the book's scope. Um, so part one begins with the 15th century, 15th century encounters between Spanish colonizers and the hemisphere's indigenous peoples, and it extends to the ratification of the U.S. Constitution. So one way of looking at this is that this is to say that nearly half of the history presented here occurs before the United States existed as a distinct geopolitical entity. Part two picks up with the rampant dis dispossession on which the new republic was built, and it extends through the late 20th century um, when new movements and discourses surrounding indigenous sovereignty emerged in the context of um, global and domestic Cold War politics. I will note um, that the rediscovery of America effectively ends in the 1970s and 80s um, with just a kind of a few quick pages that extend into the 1990s. And given how, I, I guess I should say, as a modern historian, a historian largely of the 20th and 21st centuries, um, and given how momentous the last several years have been in Native and U.S. history, so if you think back to like Standing Rock, um, more recently the movement for missing and murdered Indigenous girls, women, and two-spirit individuals, um, to the, the appointment of Laguna Pueblo citizen uh, Deb Holland as Secretary of the Interior, part of the, the presidential cabinet. Um, given all of that, I personally found myself wishing that Dr. Blackhawk had extended his analysis, extended that kind of dialectical analysis of, of Indian settler, settler relations to the present. Um, but for those of you who are interested in that, um, I might suggest that you pick up just one more, at least one more, I should say, um, Native, Native history book after finishing Rediscovery of America. And that is The Heartbeat of Wounded Knee. Native America from 1890 to the present, written by the Ojibwe scholar David Treyer. This too is part of this kind of wave of, of syntheses um, in the last maybe five years or so. Actually, I think um, David's book was published in 2018. Now, it would obviously be impossible for me to summarize this book um, or even to attempt to really do justice to its many interventions and themes. Um, what I'd like to do instead 
um, is to offer a few examples of some of the encounters, episodes, or moments that Black Hawk describes, um, with a particular emphasis, in terms of my selection of them, on the interplay between Native peoples and U.S. constitutionalism. Um, in a review published in the Washington Post of Hemelinen's book of Indigenous Continent, Dr. Blackhawk noted that he found the absence of this theme um, especially regrettable in that text. So we'll kind of zoom into that here. I will also note, I, I think Professor Blackhawk wouldn't mind me saying that it just so happens he is married to a woman named Maggie Blackhawk, who is a really prominent and important um, indigenous constitutional scholar. Um, she's like one of my heroes. So I, I think that, that um, his serious thinking around this, um, I think, I, I like to imagine has been informed by all sorts of wonderful conversations within the home as well. So picking up in the final chapters of part one, we might first look to the creation of the nations, and by, in this context, I'm referring to the United States here, founding documents, so the, the, these founding documents. Here, as elsewhere in the book, Black Hawk takes a you know, relatively familiar episode in US history, and by, by relatively familiar, I mean um, moments that would be covered in almost any US history survey right, of, of this period. Um, and it views it from, the, uh, from a perspective that encompasses indigenous history. And the, the title of chapter five really captures this dynamic. The chapter is titled Settler Uprising, and its subtitle is The Indigenous Origins of the American Revolution. Black Hawk observes that, quote, the revolution in nearly all narratives originated in seaports like Boston, and the enlight en enlightenment ideas of liberty, virtue, and self-representation continued to be seen as the principal forces motivating independence. Now, Blackhawk locates much of the story of these decades leading up to the American Revolution instead in the interior, um, which remained under the effective control of indigenous peoples who defended their homelands and who blocked the expansion that land hung hungry settlers saw as their due. Frustrated by the Crown's efforts to restrain lawless and unorderly expansion and outraged by the lack of official protection for settlers encroaching on Indian lands, Settlers' anti-Indian racism is reflected in um, the colonists' list of, of grievances against the king. Quote, he has excited domestic insurrections amongst us, the Declaration of Independence reads, and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers, the merciless Indian savages. The Declaration of Independence excuse me, the Declaration of Independence, a liberatory document in so many ways, right, is simultaneously, and some would argue inextricably, a document that justifies and rationalizes the often violent uh, dispossession on which the new republic would be built. Black Hawk goes on to foreground struggles for um, authority over interior lands, um, as well as uh, increasing recognition of the need for centralized authority in diplomacy with Native nations as among the forces that led the founders to abandon the Articles of Confederation, abandon the first government, and adopt a new constitutional government in 1787. With the ratic ratification of the U.S. Constitution, treaties with Native nations, treaties that U.S. authorities began signing before the revolution's conclusion became the, quote, supreme law of the land, which is a phrase people have sometimes heard. This is important because treaty making is drawn from international diplomacy. It's premised on a relationship between sovereign powers. The United States continued to negotiate treaties with native groups well into the 19th century even as white American expansion, forced indigenous displacement and warfare constrained indigenous autonomy, and even as Congress and the Supreme Court performed really all, all manner of mental gymnastics to diminish the recognition of tribal sovereignty in US law. Now, continuing on with these themes, the next kind of key moment I want to turn to is the period following the US Civil War. When many Americans think of the civil, of the, excuse me, when many Americans think of the Reconstruction era that followed the Civil War, what comes to at least many minds is federal efforts to reorganize Southern states, um, to re reunite a union torn asunder by 
sectional civil war, um, and to incorporate newly freed African Americans into American political life. Historians of Native America and the American West, however, have argued that it's, um, I guess I'll say, perhaps more complete to view Reconstruction as a national project that included the expansion of federal power across the continent, um, and included efforts to incorporate Western lands and the people who inhabited them into a rapidly moderni modernizing United States. And Ned Blackhawk follows the lead of, of this group of scholars here who thinks of, of Reconstruction and th that era in this way. As individuals, Native Americans are explicitly excluded from the 14th Amendment, one of the major constitutional developments of the Reconstruction era, but they remained protected by the Constitution as members of a collective through the hundreds of treaties signed and ratified by the US Congress. Treaties remained, as I mentioned, and still remain the supreme law of the United States per the US Constitution, but in the context of the nation's post-Civil War objectives, the US government began to conceptualize treaties with Native nations much differently. And here I'm going to read directly from uh, Dr. Blackhawk on this, from a chapter entitled Taking Children and Treaty Lands. Quote, through reconstruction, as Congress expanded the administrative ca capacity of the federal government, it assumed a new power to abrogate the Republic's treaty commitments. Treaties were no longer binding. Their provisions could now be broken with legislative impunity, a plenary power ev eventually authorized by the Supreme Court. What had been, still Blackhawk's words, a percolating doctrine across much of the 19th century now boiled over as Congress developed powers over Indian affairs that earlier justices had considered inappropriate. Blackhawk really underscores this moment of change and also the implications of these, this change by sort of floating a, a, a counterfactual or a counterhistorical. Um, he says the early history of the United States would look radically different if states and their representatives have been able to dispossess Indian nations in this way, which is to say if, if earlier justices had in fact um, deemed some of these later moves and actions appropriate. In 1871, the United States ended treaty making with Native nations altogether. It stopped negotiating new treaties, and while existing treaties still theoretically remained in effect, um, as I just mentioned, the US government found other ways of undermining them in this period. The problem for the United States, this nation seeking to expand and uh, consolidate its power, was the sovereignty that the process of treaty making um, implies. So instead, during and following Reconstruction, the federal government took steps to constrain Native sovereignty and to detribalize and individualize Native peoples. The idea here was that once Native peoples were uh, convinced or coerced to discard their languages, um, renounce their cultural and spiritual practices, convert to Christianity, adopt Western ways, and so on and so forth, then they would be assimilated into American society as individuals. And if you're familiar with United States history and um, think of some of the kind of American, Americanization efforts um, targeting uh, immigrant groups um, from from certain regions in, in this period, right? There's kind of they're comparable um, sort of compar prom comparable efforts, comparable processes. So the taking children part of of Black Hawk's chapter that I just mentioned refers in part to the federal boarding schools. Um, these schools that sprang up in the last decades of the 19th century and that were intended to play a central role in the assimilation process. If you want to transform um, Native peoples, right, into um, kind of individualized, detribalized American citizens, right, targeting children and through education, right, was, was um, viewed as a kind of very logical um, process. As many historians have uh, documented, there's uh, lots of scholarship on the history of these boarding schools. Generations of Native children were removed from their homes com and communities and placed in government-run or supported boarding schools that, that promised 
that promise the kind of transformation that this isn't the highest quality photograph, but that you can maybe kind of see here. Um, this new genre of photography, the kind of before and after pictures, um, uh, became kind of a staple of, of the promotion of some of these boarding schools. And these photos in particular are of Carlisle students um, at Carlisle uh, Industrial Indian School in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. So um, the eastern half of the eastern part of the country here. Um, and so if you think kind of geographically, right, that, that means that many of these children were, were um, hundreds, even a couple thousand miles, right, from, from their homes. Um, one more, this is a kind of relatively famous photograph of Carlisle students. Um, I'm not able to talk about um, boarding school history at, at much length, but this is when I, I find students are often very interested in this history. And if folks are interested in learning more, um, Carlisle, um, the folks at Carlisle have created a really, really amazing digital resource, which is literally, I believe, the Carlisle Digital Resource Center, and it has um, photographs, primary source documents, um, information about the, the cemetery and some of the repatriation work. So it's, it's just a really rich resource. The objective of these schools, as well as other assimilationist initiatives that accompanied them, was without question to, um, it was cultural genocide. The Carlisle's founder, describes his school mission as, or his school's mission as, quote, to kill the Indian in him and save the man. Now, thankfully, when viewed from the vantage point of the 21st century, it's clear that this mission, while certainly harmful, um, it failed. And that's a reality that becomes evident in the last quarter of Black Hawk's book. And so in that spirit, I want to close kind of on a, a, a bit of a more optimistic note by looking at some of the uses to which this generation of Native peoples who came of age during the assimilation era put their often coerced Western educations. As Blackhawk puts it, this is a generation that, quote, worked collectively to create an American future that included Native peoples, end quote. And so this meant pushing back against um, the erasure and marginalization that they encountered in much of their daily lives. They sought to use their Western educations and their ability to read, write, and speak in ways that, that might reach and even appeal to an audience of white Americans as tools through which to um, advance what they viewed as important Native causes. In 1911, um, dozens of educated Native Americans gathered in Columbus, Ohio to form a, a national intertribal or pan-Indian organization called the Society of American Indians. This is a, a photo of that society um, from uh, the fifth annual conference, so a few years later. Um, this is a, a group that was loosely modeled on the recently created NAACP, um, which uh, was founded in 1909. And part of the SAI's work was in confronting racism. They lectured back in the 1910s about the harms of racist commemorations like Columbus Day. Um, according to the group's first report, they especially targeted, quote, that part of the white race that believes that it has inherently superior rights and is morally justified in pr oppressing Native peoples. And this is something that they push back against. But their work was not only defensive. They also advocated that Native peoples should have US citizenship, which many Native people lacked in these years. They didn't present the US citizenship as a kind of a simple route to integration and assimilation, as some white Americans who promoted US citizenship hoped it would be. Rather, given the constraints that they faced at this time, they believed that US citizenship offered the best chance of advancing Native individual and also collective rights. So the vision of citizenship that they put forth was what scholars have referred to as a, a layered citizenship, in which Native peoples would be citizens of both their tribal nations and the United States. Right? We have other models, of course, of du dual citizenship. And as it happens, uh, their efforts proved in influential. In 1924, in response both to their advocacy and Native people's robust and heroic participation in World War I, Congress passed the Indian Citizenship Act, which granted US citizenship without undermining tribal membership. And many Native peoples maintain this dual citizenship today. And I, in closing, I just wanted to give an example of, of one of these SAI intellectuals. This is an early indigenous feminist named Loria Cornelius Kellogg. Um, this is a figure that Black Hawk dedicates quite a bit of attention to because she was just fascinating. Um, 
very well educated by any standards. She had traveled throughout um, Europe. She also dedicated her much of her life to both kind of intellectual um, contributions and also activism in terms of advocating for Haudenosaunee land claims and so forth. But I, what I wanted to mention about her to kind of bring us back to um, that quote um, from the first page of the book about democracy um, is that in 1920, Laura Kellogg published a book um, that is still available online. I have my students re read it regularly called Our Democracy and the American Indian. And it's a book that theorized and analyzed the relationship between Native nations and the United States government. Um, it analyzed Native people's relationship to democracy and much more. And I wanted to close with that because I think it's worth noting that in all sorts of fora, um, written and otherwise, Native Americans have been contributing to our collective understanding of um, democracy, citizenship, sovereignty, some of these themes um, that Lepore was and is concerned about ever since. So I'll, I'll stop there and would love to take a few questions if we have time. Looks to me like we'll make sure. Is it James Coyne? James Coyne. James Coyne or Coiny? Yeah, okay, I will get it to you in one second. Why don't we start with questions? Do we have a question? Yes, and then yeah, let's start. What kind of impact does this group have on the way social segregation and racial justice now? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so, oh, yes. Um, so, let me make sure too that I get this right, that what, what kind of impact is this having in the way that like social studies is viewed in schools now? Is that correct? Okay, yeah, it, like, um, so I can tell you that I can speak more, unfortunately, to like the university level, um, where I will certainly, I, where I've taught portions of, or all of every book that I've mentioned today. Um, I, for, for my own classes, I increasingly, um, really attempt to expose students to as many different indigenous authors and scholars as possible because again there's just so much work coming out right now so my students have not yet um, read this book but they will they've read David Trayer's book um, and I think that at the university level this is a, a, a book that is really really well suited for like a, a Native American history course or um, I mean, I think that Blackhawk's objective is that maybe even U.S. history courses, um, and I, I think it's too early to kind of see. This is like we're one semester in, right? Um, but at the you know at, at the high school level, for example, um, I I can't speak to this exactly, but I, I can say that there from that 2019. Um, OAH inter, um, session I went to, you know, I was impressed by how many like high school teachers were assigning Lepore's book. And so I think that um, for some there is this openness to kind of engaging with more kind of scholarship that it, that is not textbook, right, Te straight textbooks, but that kind of bridges the academic public facing divide. And I would also mention that I, I think that there is a real move um, kind of more broadly in especially incorporate indigenous knowledges with regard to a lot of different topics, not just history. Um